Okay, welcome everybody. Um, there are lots of you today, which is great. Um, we'll just wait a few, maybe like another minute or so, just to see if anybody else joins the waiting room um, and then we can get going with the seminar. So. OK, so that was a very short minute, but we'll get going now. And then if anybody else joins, it's all fine. So welcome, everybody, um, to this, the third um, the third seminar of the Contemporary Women's Writing and Medical Humanities online seminar series, organised with the support of the Centre for Contemporary Women's Writing um, at the IMLR in London. Um, so this online seminar series for postgraduates and early career researchers um, seeks to explore how contemporary women's writing in particular, um, be this fiction, poetry, autobiography, philosophical writing, visual art, etc., cetera, um, is currently engaging with issues such as illness, disease, healthcare, medical practice, and clinical institutions. Um, there are a wide range of themes being covered and we are still accepting ongoing um, abstracts. So please feel free to send over um, any ideas. Um, we started uh, about a month ago um, in September and we are continuing until March, 2021 with fortnightly seminars, always on Tuesday evenings, at 5.30 p.m. Um, BST, um, British summertime until uh, roughly 7 p.m. Uh, you can register for the seminars via the IMLR. Um, we'll put the link for the next seminar in two weeks time in the chat um, later. And you can also, um, via the same link, have a look at the upcoming seminars in future months and look at all the different themes. Um, so now for uh, some Zoom house rules, I'm sure you're all aware of them because we're pretty much all online at the moment, but just to be safe here, we've got uh, first one, the session's being recorded so it can be uploaded to the IMLR website. Um, please feel free to turn your cameras off or on, whichever you feel is most comfortable. Um, we'll, be having, uh, we'll be having three 15 minute papers today and then a Q&A session. Um, if you could all remain on mute throughout um, the three papers until the Q&A session, this would be much appreciated. Um, however, if during the, um, the three different papers you have questions, you can always pop them in the Zoom chat um while you're kind of you know thinking and reflecting listening to the papers um or um during the q a um you can put your hand up using the kind of raise your hand sort of emoji option on zoom to ask your question sort of in person um or using your own voice or you can type them into the chat and um either ben or i will read them out um for you um and i think that is it. Yep, and uh, Ben and I will be keeping. Uh, yeah, we'll be keeping tabs on the chat, and we'll be kind of keeping um, all of your questions in you know in order. So, um, and we'll make sure that all of them get addressed during the Q and A. Um, so, I think that is my introduction done. So, over to Ben now. He's going to be introducing the theme of today's seminar, as well as the three speakers. Thank you very much, Becky. So, uh, yeah, the theme of today's seminar is death and mourning, so medical uh, humanities approaching to death and mourning, approaches to death and mourning uh, in contemporary women's writing. So um, without further ado, first up, uh, we have uh, Jordan McCulloch, who is a PhD student, uh, PhD candidate in French studies at Queen's University Belfast. His doctoral research project funded by the AHRC through the Northern Bridge Consortium is centered on contemporary parental récits de deuil and examines the role of writing in creating a continuing bond with a deceased child. His wider research interests are in the area of French studies, med and French studies medical humanities, and he is the author of two articles in this field, one published earlier th this year in Modern and Contemporary France, 
and another forthcoming in the winter issue of the Australian Journal of French Studies. So thank you very much, Jordan. I'll put it over to you now. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen. This awful part, I was gonna make sure hopefully it all works. Yes, okay. Um, so, first of all, I just wanna say thank you very much to Ben and Becky for organizing this and for allowing me to be part of it. Um, I'm really excited to hear the other papers as well. So I think this will be a, a really great session um, and I'm looking forward to the, the Q&A after and I'm sure you'll have lots of ideas that undoubtedly will help me as I work through this, this chapter of my thesis. Um, so, I get started. I'm just going to start a, a timer for myself because that way I can keep myself on track if that's okay. Um, sorry. Okay, here we go. So, in the introduction to their volume on continuing bonds and bereavement, the first substantive study on the topic, Phyllis R. Silverman and Dennis Class argue that, quote, memorializing remembering, knowing the person who has died and allowing them to influence the present are active processes that seem to continue throughout the survivor's entire life. And it is therefore normative for mourners to maintain a presence and connection with the deceased, end of quote. Turning to the specificities of parental grief, they note that, quote, bereaved parents recognize the reality of their children's death and still maintain the love and care they have for them. Sorry, uh, yes, that's okay. Um, and a role for them in their lives. It would appear therefore that the continuation of the bond and bereavement is particularly pronounced in the case of child death. To quote Silverman in class again, bereaved parents report that there is a specific part of their self that is devoted only to parenting the dead child, end quote. So with this in mind, we come to a better understanding of Tony Walter's argument that the purpose of grief is not to move on without those who have died, but to find a secure place for them. In the context of Sophie Dull's debut novel, Kemi Mono Volé, the secure place for Dull's deceased daughter exists not only at the level of memory, but also becomes manifest in a textual form through the prolongation of Kemi's life in the text. Indeed, as Dull stated in a radio interview broadcast shortly after the publication of Kemi, it is within the text that Kemi's life can be extended. This paper will thus examine the role of writing in continuing a bond with a deceased child through an exploration of the ongoing parenting evidence in Dull's text, before concluding with a suggestion that Dole's writing, in addition to keeping Camille alive and continuing a relationship with her, also allows Dole to fulfill her parental duty by preparing Camille to voler de ses propres ailes as she transitions to the new state of being as an être de papier, a term Dole borrows from another brief parent author, Philippe Forest. I should also say, I meant to mention at the start, that um, I've provided most quotations in translation, but some of the concepts don't quite work so well in English, so in that case I have kept them in French, but I'm happy to expand on that in, in the discussion. So, with Kemi Mon Envolée, Sophie Dull makes a transition from the world of stage and screen to text. In this regard, she follows a well-established pattern of brief parents deciding to prendre la plume and produce a text in the aftermath of their loss. What is significant about many of these bereaved parent author texts, however, is the substantial number of bereaved parent authors who have never written a narrative before. It is the death of the child that prompts them to turn to writing. And even in the cases of parents who were established authors prior to the loss of a child, as Jill Rye rightly notes, their grief writing almost always, quote, takes the form of a new departure, end quote. As such, I feel it's safe to argue that there is something unique about the writing experience of a bereaved parent that causes a rupture with all that has gone before. The uniqueness of the writing experience therefore inevitably produces a, or in some cases, a series of singular texts. The reason behind this is the nature of the bond with the child, both pre and post death. In the case of Sophie Dull's text, the writing process results from a double desire. On the one hand, a desire to keep Kemi alive, and on the other, a desire to begin a process of self-reconstruction. As Dull remarks in that previously referenced radio interview, her writing was a necessity that emerged almost instantaneously, more than likely resulting from the process, from both a process of self-reconstruction and from a need to remain with her, her being Kemi, for as long as possible. I knew that losing Kemi brought with it the potential for a breakdown, which required an immediate restructuring of the self. And I knew that words would be my best friends as I undertook this process. Then on the other hand, writing was a means of remaining with her, since the text is a long letter to my daughter and I had the feeling that by constantly speaking to her, I was keeping her alive a little longer. Thus Dahl's primary aim in writing is to keep Kemi close, to extend her life and the relationship via the text. We also see this referenced within the work when, for example, Dahl writes, um, I'm back in Montreux, a sweetheart. I got back yesterday. There's only one thing I want to do, to be with dad and keep writing this text, to be with you, of course. Writing keeps you alive. 
In Doll's mind, the text provides a space wherein Kemi can continue to exist. She's kept alive in the text, almost like a form of literary life support. However, it is the notion of prolongation that interests me most here. If the text represents an extension of Kemi's life, then it affords Doll more time to be with her daughter. This extra time, I would argue, allows the author and reader to prepare both herself and her daughter for the transition to a new phase of life. This transition is linked with Kemi's age when she passes away. At 16 years old, she is almost at the stage of adulthood and all references this throughout the text, speaking of Kemi starting to wear high heels, wearing makeup, waxing her legs, etc. However, as, as adult as Kemi may appear, her bedroom is still filled with her, six, her 77 cuddly toys, and thus there remains some maturing to be done before Kemi is ready for a new phase of independent life. Hence, the ongoing parenting we find in the text has this overarching aim. To enable Doll to fulfill her parental duty, bridging these lost years via the text in order that Kemi might fly the family nest and arrive in that new phase of life. The motivation behind the text then explains its structure. As a long, a long letter to my daughter, there is, that's a quote, sorry, from, from Doll's interview, there is a certain instructive quality to the writing. The direct address in the two form is central to this, and arguably it is this convention of direct address that categorizes literary ongoing bond, or continuing bonds rather, we find in texts by bereaved parents. Indeed, whether consciously or not, Dole positions herself within a broader tradition of direct address and literary continuing bonds when she writes, for a day or two now, it's almost like I'm lovingly surrounded by a circle of dead children. You would almost think they were playing duck duck goose. They were dancing in a circle and leaving a little treasure behind my back the little swatch of their impossible and wavering presence. Malarmé Anatole, Hugo's Léopoldine, Sophie's Gaspard, Zilias Bayard, Foris Pauline, Jérôme Medi, and Noé Rostin's Lyon. should also say if the translation there seems a little odd, it's because the closest version of uh, La Chandelle is Duck Duck Goose, but it involves a little handkerchief and you drop it behind the person's back and that's the equivalent of this kind of tap on the head to run in the circle. So that's why the, the translation seems a little strange here. But the, the presence anyway is what she refers to as that little handkerchief that's dropped. Um, so although I've not read all of the text referenced here, in those that I have read, this literary continuing bond is an operation. It is therefore no coincidence that Doll later borrows from Forrest when she comes to describe Camille's next phase of being. In Camille, this direct address in the two form is evidenced from the outset of the text. You've been buried for exactly a week, buried without your heart and your brain. They're being examined in the Salpetriere's pathology department. While potentially jarring, these opening lines establish a pattern of dialogical connection that will run throughout the text. Rather than speaking about her daughter, the author narrator rejects the third person in favour of a second person engagement that allows her to speak to her deceased child. That said, the narrator is fully aware of how absurd it is, at least in the eyes of society, to address une morte in the two form. It's, completely, uh, it's a completely absurd narrative because I'm addressing it to a dead person. I'm calling you you. I'm calling you sweetheart, even though you can't hear me anymore, but I owe it to you. End of quote. Moreover, Dawes' need to justify her writing, as seen later in the opening chapter, is also broadly reflective of the lack of comprehension that surrounds parental grief and child loss in contemporary French society. While scholars have noted that a number of social taboos are beginning to melt away in the French context, child death remains, in Dawes' words, the unnameable above all unnameables, the unnamed. Dawes' writing therefore creates a space wherein this unnameable might be discussed and wherein a connection that wider society almost completely overlooks and indeed often rejects might be allowed to exist. The final point to make with regards to literary continuing bonds in Kemi concerns audience. In the first instance, this text was not written for a wider readership. As Doll remarks in this the previously referenced interview with Bernard Lehu, this turn towards apologies, this turn towards writing was first and foremost for her, for her father, and for me. And it was later that the notion of a potential reader emerged. This allows us to better understand why I consider this text to be an extension of the parental relationship. This text was not initially envisaged for the eyes of an external reader. This hypothèse came afterwards as Dole came to understand the potential of her writing to speak in difficult experiences of other bereaved parents. This perhaps explains the intimacy we find within the text and the impudeur, to use Dole's term, which categorizes the mother-daughter dialogue. Of course, we must also take account of the fact that both Doll and Kemi were very accustomed to the epistolary form. Doll often wrote letters to Kemi while on theatre tours, and writing thus became an important medium for the sharing of their bond. As such, we might consider certain elements of this text a natural extension of the pre-existing form of intimacy and connection shared between mother and daughter. Uh, and then I'm bored without you, without writing to you. We wrote to each other all the time, our letters, our texts. I'm going to forge your afterlife with a pen soaked in your gaze, serious, direct, radiant.
Through writing, Doll remains fidèle to her daughter. She holds Kemi close and establishes her in an interstitial space of being, kept alive in the text, but for now at least, held in a space wherein only mother, father and daughter can connect. It is this in-between space we'll now consider as we examine how Doll prepares Kemi for an eventual release, not only in terms of their ongoing relationship, but equally for that new phase of life in which she will also reside in the hearts of the readers. The author and reader's first concern in writing is to demonstrate her love and admiration for her daughter. She wants to ensure that in the first instance, Kemi is fully aware of just how, how much in awe her mother is of her. I'm going to uh, recount your battle in detail, your fight, Fleet's Creek, because my goodness, how strong you were in enduring the fever and the pain, a decorated veteran, military cross. During the four days of her illness, Doll had not had the opportunity to communicate this to Kemi. Neither did she know how important it would be to do so. It is only when Kemi dies that Doll comes to fully understand the strength that her daughter exhibited throughout her final days and hours of pain and suffering. The central motif of positive affirmation of ensuring that Kemi knows just how strong and well equipped she is for whatever might come next is, uh, is recurring throughout the text. And I just place another example on the screen for you now. Moreover, the text also bears witness to several features of the pre-existing mother-daughter relationship. So given time constraints, I've chosen to discuss just one of these traits. However, it's important to note that many of the features of the tangible mother-daughter relationship are also evidenced in its new textual form. So let's consider the affectionate teasing and sarcasm that categorise uh, Kemi and Doll's relationship in the final days, of, well, throughout the, the, her life, but also in the final days of Kemi's life. The question of a potential teenage romance is a constant source of this teasing. Early in the text, Doll comments on the fact that Kemi plans to spend yet another evening out with a certain Baptiste. Another evening out with Baptiste, huh? Are you sure you don't have a little crush? Pfft, rubbish, she said, rolling your eyes. Similarly, when Doll goes to Kemi's grave, she writes, I also noticed you'll be almost directly facing Gabrielle Nonchemanche, just slightly offset, but your feet will soon be touching when the roots of the trees grow some more. Do you remember him? That kid who lived near us and died of cancer. The plaque in his grave reads 1995 to 2010, a graveyard fling, an underground affair, or underground love affair. While it might seem odd and comfortable even to read of the mother teasing her deceased child, this stands as a testament to the nature of the relationship Doll continues to enjoy with Kimmy, a relationship that exists outside of the bonds of time and space, and allows her to access a level of emotional truth as she seeks to stay true to the pre-existing mother-daughter relationship. Similarly, we find a further example of this later in the text with Marilou, the daughter of a close friend. And again, I'll just leave you to, to read that quotation. We have the impression here that Doll wishes to agacer Kemi yet again, not out of any deliberate attempt to hurt her daughter, but rather in a further attempt to stay true to who they were and who they continue to be. Indeed, Doll previously, in, in the previously referenced interview with Bernard Lehu, um, yeah, sorry, um, following Kemi's death, she notes, Doll notes that she was still the same with this grief en plus. Thus, it should come as no surprise that the post-death relationship retains many of the characteristics of its pre-death counterpart. In affirming the almost identical nature of this new phase of relationship with its predecessor, Doll also retains an element of her own identity as a mother. We see this also at times um, in the way that author, author and reader speaks to her daughter. So take, for example, a comment midway through the text, which I don't have on the screen seemingly. <laughs> Too bad, I'm digressing, but I have to tell you how Clara found out you had died. Here we're given the impression that the mother knows best and that Kemi simply must know this information. It's fundamental for her progression into that new phase of life. A further example is found later, it's the example on the screen, um, where Doll speaks about a dream that she would like to share with Kimmy. I'd also like to tell you about a dream I had a while ago. Can you hear me? I'm just, it's just to amuse you in case you're bored there among the worms. We loved it when I used to tell you my dreams because mum tells them so well. Well, here goes. Listen. As Doll checks in with Timonton, it's not long before she's telling Kimmy simply to écoute. Again, the tone of the dialogue appears typical of parent-child relationships. The parent tries to share something important with the child, but they're off in their own world. The parents ask, do you hear me? Are you listening? There's no response, so they resort to the imperative, listen to what I'm saying. Yet even in this fairly direct form of speech, there remains an undertone of love, care and affection. Wherever Kemi is, Doll wants to ensure she isn't bored and that she still has those much loved stories that she so enjoyed. And Doll knows this will make Kemi happy and it's the desire to protect and care for her that drives her on in her writing. So this desire to care and protect is shown throughout the text in the choosing of Kemi's final resting place and in the desire for her mother, Kemi's grandmother, uh, to quote, pop in and say hello sometimes. So Kemi's grandmother is, is also dead. 
However, this desire to protect shift, shifts slightly as Dole comes towards the end of the text and realizes that she will have to release Camille, not to sever bonds with her as per the Freudian model, but rather to allow her to embrace that new phase of life for which she has sought to prepare her throughout the text. So in this final section, I will very briefly examine Camille's transition to a new phase of being. This new life is intimated early in the text when Dole states, quote, you will watch over me and guide me just as you used to, as you promised, as you liked me to do. However, it's not until the final third of the text that we see it more fully developed. Speaking of how Dole envisages her ongoing extra textual, connect, textual connection with Kimi, she writes, um, later you'll come and visit me in my dreams, I think, just like mom, your grandmother who you never knew came after a while to visit me at night. In my dreams, perhaps you're going to become my mother. You are going to become my mother. I would be your child. While writing this, sweetheart, I think in fact it's already happening. Yes, I'm becoming your child. I'm scared that you won't be there and I feel you protecting me. Here we see the inversion of the mother-daughter relationship in action, thereby providing evidence for Paul Rosenblatt's assertion that, quote, some parents feel the child has become more parental of the parents, for example, as a protecting force, end quote. As the mother-daughter relationship shifts, there's a marked parallel between the transition from a young person's teens into adulthood. Kimmy take, uh, takes on a greater degree of independence in order to become the protector of the family. The previous 120 pages have brought us to this place where Doll is almost ready to release her daughter. However, there's still some work to be done. So although we don't have time to explore it further here, in the following 60 pages, there are several examples of actions that prepare both Doll and Kimmy for this new phase of life. Collectively, these actions bring us to the place where just three pages before the end of the text, the author reader can write, I've stopped worrying about you. Now I'm going to have to stop writing. Writing was still a form of worry, a spasm of life in my words. I'm scared about leaving you, but I must. I can't keep crying for four years when you fought for just four days. You were so brave that my act of bravery will be this very next full stop. While these words might appear to be a final adieu to Kemi, as Dol later comments, this was not the case. When Bernard Lehu questions whether the connection is really broken, given the fact that the given the fact of speaking about Kemi is both an absence and a wonderful presence as well, Dol responds, absolutely. But I could never have imagined the benefits this book would have brought to my life. You're right, there's an undeniable presence. Thus, the final line of the text, Adieu mon enfant, goodbye my child, is not a permanent farewell nor a definitive cutting of ties with Kimmy, rather, it represents a release of the child into her new phase of being as an être de papier dans le cœur des lecteurs. Thus, by providing Kimmy with the envol she needs to enter this new phase of life, Dole inaugurates that much desired outre vie for Kimmy, while still maintaining a connection that that goes beyond established notions of grief and mourning. In contrast to Julie Rogers' view, therefore, I would suggest that rather than the text enabling Dole to, quote, enter into a new phase of existence without the daughter, end of quote, the text is in fact the means by which an ongoing relationship is maintained. For it is thanks to the text that Dole, quote, can without fear of being silenced, continue to speak about her daughter or about her death at any rate, and thus about her. And thanks to this ongoing speaking of and reading about Kimmy, quote, without any, turn to the supernatural, Kemi continues to exist because there are more people thinking about her or meeting her for the first time. As such, Sophie Dahl's Kemi Mon Envolé enables us to push beyond existing conceptualizations of continuing bonds by demonstrating the role of literature in facilitating an ongoing connection between parent and child. In this release of Kemi into a new phase of life, Dahl's text sits apart from many other works of parental grief writing, which instead bear witness to a never-ending cycle of writing and rewriting the deceased child's life. Perhaps, as I've suggested, the age of the child has an important role to play in this. Nonetheless, by understanding Dole's writing as a means of a continuing, of continuing a bond, in order that the mother's parental duty might be fulfilled, we gain a fresh perspective on this text that in turn allows us to situate it within a lineage of parental grief writing that seeks to maintain and extend the pre-death relationship with a deceased child. Thank you. Thanks, Jordan. Round <laughs> Thanks so much for that, Jordan. Uh, that, that was brilliant. I've got loads of questions that I want to ask about that at the end. Um, so, I'm um, going to move on to Norwood. Tamarin uh, Norwood. So, Tamarin Norwood gained her doctorate in fine art as a Clarendon scholar at the University of Oxford in 2018 and is now a postdoctoral research fellow at the Drawing Research Group, Loughborough University, writing a book on metaphor and neonatal loss. She is also a visiting early career research fellow at the Centre for Death and Society, University of Bath, and 
uh, postdoctoral research assistant at the Oxford Centre for Life Writing, University of Oxford. Tamarin's scholarly publications focus on representation and loss in drawing. Her related prose fiction, poetry and artwork have been published and shown widely, including with the BBC World Service, Art on the Underground, ICA Philadelphia, MOCCA Toronto and Tate Britain. Much of her work is interdisciplinary, most recently as part of Hubbub, the inaugural Hub residency at Wellcome Collection London. And uh, Tamarin's uh, paper today is called Something from Nothing, Constructing a Narrative When a Baby Dies at Birth. Thanks very much, Tamarin. I'm unmuted. Did you hear none of that? Yeah, yeah, none of that. So yeah, do you want to have another go? And I thanked Becky. Thank you so much for having me. And Jordan, most of all, thank you for such a, a fabulous paper. Um, it shocks me to say this, but I'm one of the bereaved parents that you were writing about. And my project is indeed to do this, this form of writing. So I was listening with um, very open ears and I look forward to much discussion. So this is my paper, Constructing a Narrative When a Baby Dies at Birth. When uh, a terminal fetal diagnosis is made during pregnancy, the exceptionally entwined relationship of mother and baby can provide a unique perspective of the liminal borderlands between life and death. In this paper, I'll draw upon a coincidence of two domains of my own experience to explore how narrative and specifically esoteric meaning making through metaphor can help to bind together the diverging, the diverging life courses of loved ones when death is near. In many ways, the symbiosis of pregnancy continues long after the cutting of the cord, as this very striking interpretation makes clear. Quote, mother and offspring live in a biological state that has much in common with addiction. When they're parted, the infant does not just miss its mother. It experiences, let me just move the, here we have it. It experiences a physical and psychological withdrawal from her host of sensory stimuli, not unlike the plight of a heroin addict who goes cold turkey. Up to a point, this seems to work both ways. Even though I wasn't dependent on my baby for survival, the day after his death, I noticed that holding the bundle of his blanket to my chest provoked a wonderful all over feeling of physical relief, as though my body's demands were being answered by embracing something of his size and his weight. Of course, there's only so far that such a blanket, there's only so far that a blanket can go, although it does go quite far and I'll come back to the materialities of neonatal death in due course, but to get through grief, people of course need more than blankets. They need cultural scripts that make sense of death in terms of the society that they're part of. When it comes to such scripts, excuse me, I'm just having trouble with, when it comes to such scripts, when it comes to neonatal loss, we are specifically short of such scripts, be they formal or informal. Formal acknowledgements such as a death certificate or a funeral may or may not be available at all, depending on the, um, the, 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 the weeks of gestation. And informal acknowledgements may minimize or invalidate parents' feelings of grief. In the very well-meaning, and I should add they are well-meaning, people do their very best and it's very difficult to know what to say, but in the well-meaning reassurances of family and friends and medical professionals. I'm sorry, I'm having troubles moving slides across. There we are. Um, we see an active culture of denial and intellectualization that discourages parents from assuming the role of the bereaved and from being able to grieve as they're reassured, for instance, that the death was for the best, that it happens all the time, that they can always have another baby. Such responses, and I reiterate, these are well-meaning responses, and I think it's very difficult to know what to say, and it's great that people even say something because the opposite can be very true. Such responses can deny the unique personhood of that baby and contribute to an experience of disenfranchised grief, that is, a state of bereavement not openly acknowledged or publicly mourned or socially supported and compounding this disenfranchisement is the fact that the baby was itself unknown to the parents who will often report confusion within themselves not knowing quote who or what they've lost and this contributes to a further sense of overall unreality. This absence of cultural scripts goes some way towards explaining why the pattern of perinatal grief is at, higher, is, at, is at higher risk of becoming pathological over time. So it's very clear that bereaved parents sorely need a framework within which to understand and describe and integrate the unique nature of their loss. 
so you will have gathered that I'm speaking from my own experience as a recently bereaved mother. Our second son died in my arms two years ago when he was 72 minutes old, following a pregnancy during which we learned that his lungs were not developing and that although he was stable where he was, once brought out into the light as birth is fittingly described in some languages, he'd been unable to breathe air and he would very peacefully as it turned out, die. What makes this story unusual is that as I was preparing for our baby's birth and death, I was also preparing for a doctoral viva, for a thesis I'd submitted before I knew any of this was going to happen. My DPhil was in fine art and it explored liminality in representation, those marshy borderlands between the thoughts and the feelings and the ideas that are too far beneath the surface to really get your hands on and grasp. And those ideas that you do manage to dredge up to the surface and make sense of and pin down on the page in words or image. What emerged from this doctoral research was the extent to which metaphors of water and its correlates pervade the way we imagine liminality. A wide ranging landscape can be imagined between two distinct worlds. The dark underwater nighttime world of the ungraspable and the unknown, underwater, and on above the surface of the water, the lucid, breathable daylight world, home to clear sight, perspective, the firm ground of rational thought. And at the water's surface, this is where all of life's transitions play out, where life becomes death, wakefulness becomes sleep and dream, the unknown is dredged up into the light. Virginia Woolf imagines this landscape in vivid detail. She imagines letting thought let its line down into a stream, swaying, lifting, sinking, until there's a little tug on the line. You cautiously begin to haul in that small and infinitely promising little slip of an idea and carefully lay it out on the grass, where, alas, it's suddenly small and insignificant and almost lifeless. Crossing the threshold between these two worlds is no mean feat. It's almost as impossible as waking from a dream with its imaginary treasure still in your hands. This cautious struggle has been rehearsed over and over again in many traditions through world history, for instance, in the trope of the night sea journey. Think of the classical stories of the Odyssey, the Iliad, the Metamorphosis, the biblical story of Jonah in the belly of the whale, of Moby Dick. The heroes of these stories didn't send lines down into the stream as Wolf imagined, but they bodily journey down into the depths themselves, hoping to bring back up some hard won insight, vict victory or treasure of some value to life in the upper world. Where water is used to express liminality, very often it's to reflect on the struggle of making it through that liminal transition and the profound and life-threatening challenges that it brings. So you can hear in the following passage how this framework of ideas took root in my imagination during the pregnancy and grew into a series of confused images that tried to find us, and I mean me and my baby, a way out of our inescapable situation. And this is taken from a book which is still in progress, alas, still lacking a title about exactly this coincidence of art and life. I'll just read you a page from this book. Now five months into the pregnancy, we could see without ambiguity that Gabriel would not survive his brief cresting into the light of the world. But by night, the clarity of day was shot through with possibility. In these months, the nights were long and wakeful and dark and full of invention. My body was the whole of his world, I thought, so surely I had within me the means to save him. I would do anything. In the dark, my mind turned over and over the same dilemma, searching for a way out. As long as he did not surface, he was safe, I thought, like a sort of fish who would drown in air. I imagine his developing lungs like gills, Systems of paper-thin folds held apart by the water that flows between them and so delicate they collapse if brought up into the air. It's as dangerous for a fish to rise to the surface of the water as it is for a person to dive beneath it, and the effort not less great. Here was a possibility. If the effort and threat were alike for him and me, then I could reverse it and take on the effort myself. I could learn to dive, to open my eyes and hold my breath underwater. And when he was born, he would never need to try his lungs, only his gills, and we could dwell together. I knew he could swim. I'd seen it in the first of his ultrasound scans, when the grainy dark smudge in his abdomen was yet to be seen and all was still well. I heard a radio report around this time of train carriages felled at the end of their lives to the bed of the ocean where they became new reefs, their welted metal walls, coralline and pink and suckled by the gaping mouths of fish, doors and windows wide to the boneless squid that dart and hide, and I thought, there, we could live there. I could swim down and down and down and never come up, and there you would be, and there we would be safe. 
On sleepless nights, I sent out thoughts like these to probe the furthest depths of hope, of poetry, of science. Emergency beacons that one by one returned without news. Whatever outbound route they took, there was only one way back to me, my baby, as close and distant as it was possible to be. He doesn't have gills, he has lungs. All the oxygen in his blood is from my breath. The fluid in my womb is gone. And I have a living son who needs me on dry land. These nights revealed me to myself as two distinct terrains, inside, in the dark, rosy and rounded, warm and safe, a pool, an underground lake, and this was where he lived, hemmed all round by the impenetrable bank that is the surface of me, and this was where I lived. I'd never so keenly felt that I live on the surface of myself, that my body is shaped to meet what is outside itself and not within. How ill-judged it seemed that my arms, my mouth, my eyes should be out here with me. How poorly planned when there is fullness, such lively richness, such possibility within. You can see how I'm making this metaphor of water my own to get to grips with my situation in a way that wasn't factually accurate, but very precisely accurate in another way, enlarging the subtleties of feeling and indulging nuances of emotion in such a way as to make them real and give them space. And to my surprise, this metaphor became much more important and much enriched after his birth and death. For instance, in reconciling the otherwise unacceptable reality that somehow, all the time he was alive, I don't believe I ever kissed him. Thus it was with pleasure and relief that I recalled after his death, that when we talk about labour and childbirth, especially since the natural birth movement, we talk about mothers labouring in the dark shielded from the bright light and the demands of rational thought. We describe her descending into a kind of trance state, being, quote, in the zone. Oh, look, I've left out a few quotes. There we are. Being somehow in the zone, a, somewhere akin to meditation, a concentrated turning inwards, a place where language fails, which requires the displacement of rational thought from its position of privilege and space to be made for the alter rationality that belongs to embodied or instinctive thought. And it was with delight that I remembered the idea of oceanic feeling, that sense of limitless oneness with the world a very newborn baby is meant to feel, all at sea in the ocean of its mother's arms, an undifferentiatedness that Dante imagined and Rilke described and Freud imagined as the or origin of religious longing. It seemed to me that Gabriel never really surfaced from his underwater home in the womb in the oceanic days of birth before the waters of death submerged him. And although I was not dying nor being born, by an incredible stroke of luck, I was one of the people who makes it down into that place where it's dark, where there's no language, there's no logical thought, and everything is one because I was flooded with rivers of postpartum oxytocin, prolactin, beta endorphin, in my postnatal doziness, in his newborn days, in the lightheadedness perhaps of approaching death, and fused by the Lethean rivers of hormonal love, we dwelt together for the 72 minutes between his birth and death, down where everything is unknowable. Of course, I never kissed him. We were too undifferentiated from one another to be separate enough to come together in a kiss. I know it's just a story, but I live by it. Now, let's step back a bit. What actually really happened? In reality, very much less than this. This was an event that took place on a very small scale upon a very small stage and a hidden stage at that. Most of what happened was happening inside my body and inside Gabriel's body. And what wasn't happening there was happening really inside my mind, hidden even to the instruments of medicine, which were at least able to probe and scan and magnify and capture and meticulously examine the secrets enfolding in my womb. But looked at another way, these stories with their scale and grandeur and significance far in excess of the facts on the ground really work as instruments in their own right. They gave me a way to grasp hold of the tiny grains of sensation and fleeting thoughts and feelings I was experiencing and set them in poetry and metaphor as if set in an orb of translucent amber where they can be held in the hand and turned and probed and magnified and meticulously examined. So these metaphors really are precision tools. Let me give you an example. For a split second, lying in my arms, Gabriel crumpled open one eyelid, and for the briefest of moments, I glimpsed the black crescent of his eye, as though suddenly, somehow, sight was briefly cresting the surface of our shared underwater dream. 
This was a moment so powerful and strange and moving that I've returned to it over and over again. For him, perhaps this moment of sight was his greatest adventure, an effortful, earth-shattering opening of the floodgates onto a great tumbling and crashing of world, which I hope he at least sipped of before his eyes were sealed. And then I turn the image around in my hands and find other ways to look at it. Perhaps the crescent of his eye was more like the furthest leap of a fish, the gleaming curve of its back just above the waves, enough to let slip a darting, swooping, secret life beneath, where there is pleasure and something like the joy of being alive. Or perhaps this is wishful thinking gone too far. And the opening of his eye was just an involuntary newborn check of the system that meant nothing to him, as though the surfacing of that crescent of black with the prow of a stricken ship indifferently keeling just briefly breaking the surface of the waves upended by the blind luck of physics before it rolls down to the depths of the ocean floor. And what about where it leaves me? Perhaps the crescent of his eye surfacing was, for me, the black peak of an underwater mountain, cavernous and vast, unmoving, always there, but only for a moment showing. Only for a moment, but long enough to draw me to it, the crag of a rock I rush to splinter myself against. So you can see how spending time with this, turning this image in my hands and examining the grains of feeling it contains lets me acknowledge the very powerful ambivalence of my strong feelings towards a baby for whom the more love I feel, the more pain I can expect to endure. My love for him can only end in loss. Like the song of the siren on the crag of the rock just above the, ray, above the waves that lures sailors to their death and yet, knowing it will drown them, sailors still follow that song, it is so lovely. I want to close by returning to the point that neonatal loss is underserved by stories and cultural step scripts that help to make sense of what is already a very disorienting death. In this context, material objects help and can be understood as physical metaphors that tangibly stand in for a lost child. To this end, SANS, a UK stillbirth and neonatal death charity, supplies hospitals with memory boxes that contain a soft white blanket, teddies, hand and footprint kit, and an unofficial certificate of birth to, quote, produce physical evidence of their baby's lives and start forging a parental bond that will endure long after saying goodbye. In my personal experience, this is a deeply appreciated, meticulously choreographed intervention from very well-trained staff, which is so private, so achingly painful, so unacceptably out of place as to almost be a secret. Parents tend to supplement these institutionally supported practices with their own private memorials and traditions, but when they do, they seem to stay secret too even a source of embarrassment or shame. One memorable example is a bereaved mother who was reluctant to reveal to family, friends, or initially the researcher who was speaking to her, a lovingly assembled photo album of photos of the memorial of her baby taken month after month that was usually kept hidden in a, in a cupboard, seemingly perceived by the mother as irrational and shameful and perhaps too esoteric or odd to be accepted into her social world. If meaning making takes place, if meaning making takes place on a social level, co-created, sanctioned and reinforced through continued shared use within a community, then these secret practices are not doing all they could to support the needs of bereaved parents. As I said, a blanket can only go so far. This is why, for instance, SANS also hosts support groups and campaigns to make neonatal loss part of the private, the, the national converse, the, the public conversation. But this is also where I think certain narrative approaches to end of life and palliative care could make a difference. Narrative approaches to death tend to background medical language that focuses on the physical body and begin from the premise that the self is made up of stories and that you can have some hand in the construction of those stories even when life seems un intolerable or uncontrollable. For adults nearing the end of life, very often the process is about finding a narrative arc for the life they've lived or constructing one where there seems to be none or crafting new meaning within such an arc, perhaps to express a more coherent or even rewarding version of themselves and their relationships. This is creative work. For bereaved parents faced with the unreality and double disenfranchisement of socially unsupported grief for a baby even they did not know, the benefits of story making are threefold. First, as we've seen, it can create powerful narrative, robust enough to hold esoteric and otherwise unsupported thoughts and practices, creating a narrative arc that can attenuate the diversions of pathways between parent and baby, binding them together for longer, and even preparing the landscape so that the pathway of the deceased can continue in step with those left behind, continuing rather than relinquishing the bonds, of bonds after death. 
Second, a greater sense of enfranchisement might be clawed back through this process when, by creating one's own story, parents become agents of their own narrative rather than its passive recipients. And third, by releasing personal grief practices from feelings of irrationality and shame, these stories are more likely to enter the social world. And each time they do, they set about challenging the traditional womb to tomb model of the life course by gently standing up for the social identities of both the unborn and the deceased to ask whether a model of the life course which begins at birth and ends in death is currently adequate, either empirically or theoretically. So to close, with mental health and bereavement resources as stretched as they are, small and relatively inexpensive interventions might support parents to begin this journey on their own. For instance, the Sands Memory Box contains a book of poetry and accounts written by bereaved parents. Might something like this be made available to write in, perhaps guided by accessible prompts to capture the close detail of those first fleeting impressions, the tiny observations, the pleasures, the fears, the images that come to mind, however esoteric or irrational or apparently shameful. This might give them weight and space on the page, give them a physical place to be held, where they can perhaps be shared within close relationships in due course and given more weight through these interactions. I have my son's blanket and I hold it close, but I hold our story closer. I know that both in their own ways are, metaf are metaphors for something else, but this does not diminish their worth. The finely tuned instruments of poetry, metaphor and creative thought, underwater thought, can access and probe and magnify the lived experience of grief, can make the, known, the unknown known and the unspeakable speakable. If we can find ways to bring these slips of thought up into the light of day, give them a place in everyday discourse, then we can hope to create sense where there seems to be none. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, Tamarin, um, for that incredibly rich presentation and also for, for allowing us uh, into your very personal experiences as, as well. Um, so uh, next up we have Christina Robu. Um, uh, Christina Robu holds a PhD in literary theory uh, from the Academy uh, of Sciences of Moldova 2018 and she is currently working on her second PhD in French and Francophone studies. Her dissertation is tentatively titled Maladie et récit, la mise en récit du corps malade dans la fiction québécoise contemporaine, um, sickness and story, the narrativization of the sick body in contemporary Québécois fiction, and it explores the pain narratives in Quebec literature and cinema. Her research interests are medical humanities, Quebec studies, literary and critical theory, cultural studies, and French modern and contemporary literature and cinema. She is also interested in the doppelganger, fantastic literature, immigration studies, and literatures of the Francophone worlds. And her paper today is called Morning, at Morning the Living. Thank you very much, Chris. I'll pass over to you now. Thank you so much, Ben. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Ben and Rebecca, for organizing this. Thank you so much, Tamarin, for your wonderfully uh, powerful um, talk and thank you Jordan for yours. I'm gonna in a way go continue and also go a little bit against what you did because I'm going to look at it the other way around. It's going to be a story of a child talking about their uh, dying parent. So I'm gonna start uh, as Ben just mentioned the talk is called Morning the Living and the novel I'm gonna focus on is called Il préféré le brûlé. It was written, uh, published in February 2020, and the author is Rosemi Autantemora. So, in her reflection on destructive plasticity, the French philosopher Catherine Malabou explores the monstrous personal disruption which makes someone become, I quote, an absolute other, someone who will never be reconciled with themselves again, end quote. As I was exploring the idea of this form of dislocated identity and the voices emerging from such an accident, I pondered on the difference between first person and third person literary pathographies and grief narratives. While the mechanisms of uh, experiencing and narrating one's illness and pain can be rooted directly in one's physicality, thus making possible the reading through the plasticity lens, mourning requires the other and represents the alienation of parts of the eye through their disappearance. 
In Mourning and Melancholia, Sigmund Freud identifies mourning as being, I quote, a reaction to the loss of a loved person or to loss of some abstraction which uh, has taken the place of one, such as one country, liberty, an ideal, so on. And it's very relevant in the, our present. Um, so he believes that following a series of processes and uh, Sorry, uh, he believes that following a series of processes and tests of reality, the mourner detaches progressively from the lost uh, loved object or abstraction and heals. But what happens when the loss uh, is localized in the life of the other, a sick and dying other? So as part of my work on sick body representation in Quebec literature and cinema, I noticed that in the case of an imminent but ongoing death in which mourning becomes the status quo, plasticity can manifest itself in the rhizomatic intricacies which connect the mourner to the mourn. It also requires a new form of semi-mourning, so the Derridian concept, a non-healing mourn, non mourning, a non-healing a continuous and active state of grief. Thus, in this short presentation, I want to reflect on the specific forms of mourning by thinking through Morin's novel. So in this presentation uh, had uh, a tripartite um, form. I was going to start with thinking about sickness in the plasticity um, format with thinking mostly starting from uh, destructive plasticity and hacking the concept and going into disruptive plasticity. I will then include um, Derrida in the conversation with his concept of demi day and uh, the mor this morning in Presencia. And I will finish by talking about Fov. Fov is the main character of this novel, Fov's morning and resilience at the end. So uh, all of these, uh, also another mention, this is a work in progress. I just started my chapter, so I apologize for being a little bit sloppy and I'll welcome all questions, remarks and comments at the end and I really need them. So all of these elements are particularly salient in the recent novel entitled Il Préféré les Brûlés uh, that you have the, uh, the cover over here by the Quebec journalist and writer Rosemi Autonne Morin, whose picture you can see. In this autofictional text, the narrator, Fauve recounts her ongoing mourning following her father's cancer diagnosis when she was two years old and his resulting death 14 years later. Both emotional and incisive, the text presents itself as a Bildungsroman in which the coming of age of Fauve is punctuated and, um, by her father's sickness and as a result by his huge impact on her overall development and his dominance basically over her. It also shows the mental, emotional, and physical mechanisms of grief, which in turn materialize in her own sickness, but also in her wish to learn from him, to make him proud of her. And at the end of the novel, she wishes for the morning to just end. The mostly linear narration is made of short and trenchant sections, each uh, diving a little more in the intricacies of such a peculiar childhood. The provocative incipit in which no clear element of time is mentioned, welcomes the reader in a hospital room where Fov's father is in a coma, dying on a bed, while Fov on the other bed next to him regains the pleasure and autonomy of her body. And because, as I told you, the text was published uh, a few months ago, uh, it has not been translated into English yet, so I'll give you the French while doing uh, the translation in English. So I quote, he was lying on his hospital bed uh, for days now, immersed in a coma induced by drugs with complex names. I was lying on a camp bed to his right under rough sheets which were pinching my skin. I climaxed in silence, eyes on him, pleasure like a buoy. I climaxed when my father was dying, end quote. Here, the fear of the other's death is overpowered by discovering and claiming and reclaiming sexual pleasure. Uh, uh, as they are presented as intertwined, echoing each other uh, and giving the tone to the novel through this eros and tanatos, so libido and death drive sort of tension. In the medical space of the hospital where only pain, sickness and death seem to be allowed, Fov lets in, explores and uh, discloses other possibilities and forms of mourning, other tensions and extensions emer emerging from her upbringing. 
From this proliptic gate, as I see it, the narrative goes back to describing Fof's, Fof's family fairly fast paced from the moment her parents met to the point her father was diagnosed with incurable cancer. And I quote, um, at 48, he married my mother. At 50, he became my father. And two years later, he became a cancer patient with a life, life expectancy of 24 months, end quote. The first memory of Fov, uh, Fov has of her father's sickness is that of him falling down the stairs as a metaphor for the downward vortex, which is the lengthy sickness of a relative. But she also mentions not remembering the announcement of the diagnosis as if the diagnosis of cancer suddenly became a new member of the family, a status quo, which they will have to live to learn and die with. From this moment, the constant fear of finding him dead tomorrow or the day after tomorrow is the driving force of their relationship and the underlining theme of Fov's life. The shift in the father's path is presented not only through the diagnosis, but also and especially by the increased attention the father decides to give his daughter. Knowing that he abandoned several children and families throughout his life, and this is where the title of the novel comes in, he preferred to burn them. Um, uh, so Fauve realizes the ex ex exclusivity of their relationship, thus reshaping her priorities, her interests, and her understanding of both life and death. The father sets to make the perfect emancipated woman through liberated dialogues on sex, reading uh, existential writers and Quebec poets, wine drinking and chess playing from a very young age, thus metamorphosing her. In this process, he also becomes a different man, father and person by dedicating himself to her and both performing and transmitting his knowledge as heritage. And consequently, by becoming the center of the attention of her father and of his last days, Fov uh, sees herself as the lucky to be the chosen one, the chosen daughter, to learn from him, thus taking part in her father's ongoing process of dying, uh, which she wishes to discern, explore and domesticate, if that makes sense. But this limited time only relationship drags on as the last days become months and years and as the father's well-being declines, the tone of the novel changes as well. And the fabric of the mourning, the experience of the other's ongoing death becomes harder to bear. The disruption caused by can the cancer diagnosis can be read through the lens of plasticity as theorized by Catherine Malabou. So as Ben presented it to us a month ago, I think, plasticity is the transformation of life forms, which can be creative, so like a positive, uh, uh, destructive, so negative, and um, explosive, which is deadly. Uh, according to her, uh, essay, The Ontology of the Accident, I quote, as a result of serious trauma or sometimes for no reason at all, the path splits and a new and precedented persona comes to life uh, with uh, the former person and eventually takes up all the room, end quote. But this particular sickness, while being severe and incurable, doesn't completely alienate the subject from himself. Uh, as it is the case in destructive plasticity and theorized by Malibu. So Fof's father does not lose his sense of self and or a sense of existence and the being in this process. On the contrary, as a result, he gains the urgency to live, to be, and to share his experience with Fov. So here uh, I perceive a different form of plasticity, as I mentioned earlier. So I hacked a little bit uh, Catherine Malibu's concept and I invented, created, proposed a disruptive plasticity. What I believe that while the subject uh, of this disruption is still her or himself, the experience it, uh, of existence cannot be the same as it was before this disruption. So in this case, the sickness, it is necessarily dislocated, enhanced or diminished, different and just disrupted altogether. Um, this disruption punctuates the daily experience of the sick person with the shadow of the fast approaching death. This breach allows for both joy and grief to, co to coexist in a complex relationship which has intense repercussions on Fove. Her development is strongly impacted by her father's education, but even more by his disease. She interiorizes it and believes it's part of who she is. I quote, in me, there's illness and escape. They come from my father, from his cancer, and from this uh, drive which pushes one to destroy everything one loves in order to abandon it better. 
uh, I cannot escape. They bequeathed this to me between two game, uh, two card games. End quote. And this topos, the topos of abandonment and of Ashit, uh, will come back at the end of the novel and will actually show how she runs away from the hospital room into this almost fantasy world. So as uh, his days accounted, Fulv decides to go live with her father, spends the majority of time with him to, to be able to help him, thus performing multiple roles, most of them being those usually attributed to adults. While his uh, forced, well, this, sorry, forced adulthood puts Fulv's life in uh, constant contact with imminent death, it requires several coping mechanisms, which at her puberty translate in her own mental illness issues, showing the destructive, draining force of this experience. But as I mentioned earlier, it also gives Fulv the possibility to have a father, which the other children, her siblings do not have, thus presenting itself through the formative element, which will, as the novel shows, make for a vibrant and knowledgeable young woman. It is important to acknowledge this dual potential of the relationship to the imminent death, uh, that of openness, present, and affection that the two share, but also the emotional saturation produced by the process of accompanying a sick person towards imminent and certain death. In order to articulate this uh, dialectical structure, I'd like to introduce and reshape the Derridian concept of semi-mourning. So for Derrida, mourning is an endless process, which uh, is a constant actualization of the dying or dead other uh, in the form of continuing the dialogue with them and perpetuating the duty of friendship as Derrida did in most of his works actually. In Politics of Friendship, Derrida explores the grief process through the lens of friendship to which he attributes an a priori fear of loss. He defines mourning as a central one. And uh, here's a quote, Friendship for the deceased thus carries Ophelia to the limit uh, of its possibility, but at the same time, it uncovers the ultimate spring of this possibility. I could not love friendship without engaging myself, without feeling myself in advanced, engaged to love the other beyond death, end quote. So loving the other beyond the threshold of death uh, is an engaging dialogue which reveals the intensity of a relationship and constitutes the life of the lost and through the process of survival. And here I have a second quote, surviving, that is the other name of mourning whose possibility is never to be awaited, end quote. For Derrida, one needs to continue the memory of the deceased in order to perpetuate the presence and to be able to, to do the work of mourning actively, constantly, and continuously, as opposed to Freud. Uh, here we have to interrogate and explore the Derridian perspective on mourning and survey in the context of mourning of a living person who is soon to be dead. So as the text focalizes on Fauve, the biographical chronotope informs the reader about her growing understanding and interiorization of her father's sickness and through it of her own development and decay, both mental and physical. Because Fauve's development is infused with fear uh, and of losing her father, their relationship takes new forms, meanings, and practices of mourning. They're constantly, uh, they are a constantly mutating force readjusting to every plateau of her life, so be that sexual, intellectual, emotional, critical, so on. One way to read this contagion is by viewing it as a mourning itself materialized in her own illness, which as a result makes her aware of her own corporality, subjectivity, and later sexuality as a continuum form of announced mourning of the other. In a symbolic way, the survival, so the semi-morning, the Duridian semi-morning, becomes effective as her father is still alive and makes room for exchange and joy in the first years of their relationship, but it consequently mutates in a desire for closure as her father becomes sicker and weaker, thus being seen as what the narrator calls a vulnerable hero. Both creative and disruptive, uh, this period of her life is Form formative and traumatizing, it is a narrative of becoming self through the sick other. Uh, in the last day of her father's life, uh, while a social worker tells her about the seven stages of grief, uh, Fov is ready for a new stage, uh, that of desire for her father to be actually gone. I quote, 
she and she here is the social worker seems to ignore the fact that I have been through this a uh, thousand times, that this is the scenario which governed my life since I was two. Seven endless stages, death awaited once. My grief is elsewhere. Where is the desire in your damn chart? I want it to be over, do you understand? I don't need help to get ready. I need help to get him killed, end quote. Mourning could be seen here as a mode which consumes the being and because of the declining condition of her father's health uh, as an impossibility to keep him part of her life and to continue to grieve. Um, as her father is in palliative care, she, I quote, says, I will not come back to see him. I simply cannot anymore. I would like him to die tonight. I give him permission. Even better, I ask him officially, please die, dad. And it's very interesting to have the him versus the address that the two, uh, and we can talk about it later. So reverse the desire to protect and keep him alive gives room to the desire to escape, to lose and to get it over with. As death approaches and the reality of her father's condition decline, the process of mourning takes a different shape. It becomes overpowering, con uh, constraining and destructive. After his death, Fov escapes from the hospital room and enters in a different mourning phase, in a different state, and in a different world altogether. According to the psychiatrist Boris Cyrnik, who worked with traumatized children, and I quote, resilient children become great create, uh, creatives and transform their wounds into uh, works of art in order to put some distance between themselves and their trauma. They often become writers and actors. In a similar way, so Fov narrates the story. So she's a narrator. She creates the narration of her life. And of course, in a similar way, Rosé Milton uh, wrote this or fictional account of uh, the story of her life, connecting some dots, reflecting on transmission and understanding the impact of this experience. In an interview the author gave in June uh, to Issy Artevi, uh, while asked to what extent was the publication of this text therapeutic, she replied, I was in a state of compassion for the child I used to be and for the author I allowed myself to be. Because it's an autofiction, I know what is real and what is not, end quote. Burning her own bridges in a way and reconstructing them and moving forward as she was taught by her father while still uh, talking about him seems to be both diegetical and extra diegetical form of semi-mourning. And it encompasses this resilience into the text. The change, so I'm now I'm gonna slowly conclude and try to make sense of everything. So the change in the type of plasticity, so shifting it from this uh, destructive to disruptive, allowed me to show how even if it is a death sentence, the uh, extensive sickness of her father allowed the daughter to be with him, to know him and to love him and to create this bond and this relationship. Even if she was exposed too fast to certain things, she learned to grieve uh, on him soon to come death while he was still alive. So creating again, new bonds and new memories. While disrupting his life, it created an urgency that allowed intimacy and love to appear in this relationship from his part to be possible. While empowering and liberating her, it also devoured this young girl's emotional capacities and demanded of her to become an adult much sooner. The process of summer mourning is manifested here in the um, while the mourn is still alive, but also after his death, even if it shows as if there was a breakdown because of the novel itself, I'm thinking. So resilience is produced in the moment of narrating both for Fauve and for Rosemi as a form of recounting, healing, and reconnected. In this novel, Mourning, uh, the living is a creative experience, a formative force emerging from the urgency of being and becoming. For Fauve, it is a form of exploring herself and exposing herself to the unknown uh, and to the wild and unique path to adulthood paved with anxiety, fear, and, uh, and loss toward becoming a courageous woman, a formed, informed by her father. There's a very big impact of the father on the child. 
Uh, she becomes his living testament in a way, an author and narrator of her father's life death and through it of her own becoming. Presented as a constantly mutating and devouring process, active mourning is situated in the dialectical and dialogical space where creation and loss of the self and of the other are inseparable. As a final note, I could envision the ending of the novel. So the moment her father comes out of a coma for a few seconds, looks at her and then dies as what Derrida theorizes the gift of, uh, of death. So basically leaving her and taking uh, her, uh, accepting her, letting him go. So thank you for your patience. I want to uh, leave you with bi bibliographical uh, notes and also with another quote from the book. We don't have to discuss it. I just think it's wonderful. Uh, cancer as a magnifying glass in a wound. I think it is a very interesting way to close all of our talks today. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for that. Um, obviously, I've got loads that I want to ask you about plasticity, etc. Um, that you know, that was such a rich paper. But I think we'll um, we'll go straight to the uh, the Q and A. So um, we don't have uh, a lot of time, but I think it's it's kind of, it's going to be fine if we go over eight a little bit. So I will um, start by looking at the group chat and uh, the questions that you've put there. So we have a question from. Roxana Donku, who says, uh, an American poet, Dana uh, Goya, whose son died soon after birth from uh, SIDS, uh, sudden infant death syndrome, wrote a, po wrote a poem called Majority, in which he imagines the afterlife of his son mirrored in others. The poem, however, ends in a kind of letting go of the ghost of the son. Now you are 21. Finally, it makes sense that you have moved away into your own afterlife. Is this sense of letting go similar in the mother-daughter relation, or would you say that the relation is never really severed, only reimagined? So I think that that was during Jordan's paper, I, I think. So I'll hand over to, to Jordan for that. Great, yeah, thank you so much for, for that question. Um, so I would say that we see, we definitely see a level of this transition, which is kind of what I was trying to get to at the, at the end of the paper there, whereby there is a certain level of letting go. And I think at the time of writing, um, Dahl kind of envisaged this as more of a, an end, you know, she needed to, uh, she needed to let her child go because she didn't want to make it all about her and have these years of crying, as she said in that, that final quote, I think, um, compared to the, sh the shortness of the child's final battle. But actually, as the text was published, and this is something I'm kind of trying to work my way through at the minute, um, the role of publication in these texts, because so many of them are written first for, for the families, as was the case in, in this text. And I'm interested in trying to work through what it is that drives a parent to, to publish one of these. Um, I haven't got an answer on that yet, but, but I'm intrigued. Maybe we'll talk about that. Um, and um, so I think, yeah, initially it was more in a sense of, of letting go, but actually as the text was published and people started to read it, um, as Dolly said herself in that interview, it was almost like her child was not only living on for her through the text, but also in the hearts of all these people who were reading the text and being able to engage with it. Um, and I think the model that you see played out there is something quite similar to, to grief support groups, actually, um, in the sense, there's, the, I'm trying to think of the, it's one of the continuing bonds theorists. It might be Rosenblatt, or there's a French um, scholar called Oppenheim, Daniel Oppenheim, who, who talks about this as well. Um, but the idea that in a grief support group, um, a parent shares their story with all the other parents who are there. And that story is, is sort of held in tension by the other parents in the group. They get to know that child and they hold on to a legacy and a memory of that child that then allows the parents not to be so focused on keeping the child's memory alive and to begin to work a little bit on themselves and what's going on internally and coming to terms with that um, because the child in a sense lives on in the, in the memory of others and it kind of allows a, a reorientation of, of the process of working through through their grief. Um, so yeah, I think I'll stop there, but that's that's what I would say about that so far. And you can see it's kind of in an early stage of, of conception, but yeah, I'd welcome any feedback. Brilliant, thanks very much, Jordan. There's um, another comment from Roxana who says, uh, talking about cultural scripts, which makes sense of neonatal, de neonatal death, in Romanian popular culture, there is the custom that at Easter, when the resurrection of uh, Jesus is celebrated, mothers who lost their babies bring food for them and objects that a child of their age would use to their graves. So um, I think that was uh, during Tamarin's uh, 
talk. Thank you. That's I, I, I read that comment earlier on this evening and it's a wonderful prospect. Um, and, and I find it very interesting because I've been collecting the beliefs of various different cultures for, you know, and, and often they're beliefs that are d designed to console the mother um, and to, to have to play various parts and coming, coming, bringing in the, um, the, the point that, that Jordan just addressed as well in terms of um, for my, for what I'm, what I'm aiming to do when I, um, when I write about my son, um, when I finish the writing, I don't expect necessarily that there will be a, a, um, I don't, I'm not trying to prepare him in the way that um, Dal was con preparing Camille for kind of now going on to reside in the hearts of her readers. I think with Gabriel, I have the possibility of, of exhausting. Uh, he, he was so brief um, and I have the possibility of writing everything there is to write about him. And that's in a way what I'm trying to achieve. Um, I mean, there's a whole chapter of my book devoted to this millisecond when he opens his eye. And I think that's that's a solid use of a chapter. You know, I mean, he did so very little. He was here for so little time that my work is to amplify him. Um, normally an infant amplifies itself because it grows from cells into an adult. And this is a constant process of get growing and amplifying and, and, and expanding one's meanings. Gabriel didn't do very much of that. And as his mother, I can sort of play a role in, in nurturing and amplifying that in that way. Um, but, uh, but I think, uh, I think my work will come to come to a, a finish when I think I will. It will be very meaningful to me when I feel I've put down on paper the extent of his means. But I feel I have to say um, we have a six-year-old and we have Gabriel, and neither of them has changed my life less. You know, so neither of them, although he was so minute and brief, um, uh, it's hard to say which child has changed my life more. So his meanings are enormous but at the same time his life story can reasonably be exhausted in a way that the life story of a child who lived much longer you you might not even attempt that thanks very much um there's another question for tamarin from sarah i realize that i'm i'm reading out everyone's questions so if if you want to ask these questions yourself feel free to butt in sarah do you want me to read it or shall i or do you want to So I'll, I'll go ahead. So thank you so much, Tamarin, for your presentation, which was extremely moving. My question relates to abortion, which I understand might be a very sensitive topic, so I completely understand if you choose not to answer. Within the pro-choice movement, there's a wide rejection of the fact that life begins at conception, since this is usually used to paint people who choose to have abortions as murderers. However, I recently came across the argument by pro-choice activist Sophie Lewis that challenged this position. Essentially, she said that we should acknowledge that a fetus is alive while also accepting that a life that depends on the body of another being who should have the right to bodily autonomy, including the choice to end the dependent life. Um, so Sarah continues, I found this very interesting because I think that in general, we tend to reject the fetus is alive argument only when the pregnancy is not wanted. When a miscarriage or neonatal birth occurs, of course, we must recognize the baby as a baby and as alive, as to do so otherwise would invalidate the parent's grief. This might be seen as a kind of paradox. The same fetus may uh, be alive or not purely depending on whether the pregnancy is wanted. I was thinking of this again because of your discussion of how we perceive life as beginning at birth. I was wondering what you think of Sophie Lewis's argument, whether you think the widespread insistence that fetuses are not alive contributes at all to the disorientation around miscarriage or neonatal death, and what you think of this paradox I've mentioned. Thank you for raising that. Um, I, I agree it's an, a hugely complicated subject and I almost wonder whether I'm the least able to comment on it because of my experience. I mean, what I can tell you is that um, the most anguishing part of this whole experience was the summer in which I was pregnant and we were trying to understand what our future held and what, what choice I would make. Um, and, I, you know, and I, in a way I feel that if I'm to have a view on this subject, then I need to try to imagine that same anguishing summer playing out in the life of each and every single family or individual for whom this is an issue. And I, and I'm, and I'm, and I feel, I'm so sorry that I feel like I don't have a stance on it, but it's just that um, 
it was the mo it was more anguishing than his death it was more anguishing than his funeral and it was more anguishing than when we left his body in the hospital for the last time so i so that's my answer honestly um my view on this is that it 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 an individual i think that an individual to to hope to carry on through life in a way that any individual finds that they can go on through life. This is one of those moments when you need to make the decision that you hope and think and guess might allow that to happen. And obviously that decision is gonna be different for everybody. And I, and I feel like I haven't quite hit your question maybe on the head, um, but at the same time, I feel like that's, that's my kind of emphatic answer. But 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 follow up. Ask me another question if you feel like you want more. Um, I don't want to skirt the question, but I think it's a question that I'm not quite kind of qualified to answer. I hope that's not unhelpful. <laughs> it means to be helpful. Oh, thank you. No, I understand. Thank you. Good, 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 good. But thank you. Now, actually, you know, it's interesting because um, I've presented uh, these ideas and this experience and, and, and work around this subject many, many times. And I've been anticipating a question like that. And actually, yours is the first time it's come up. And it's so relevant and valid and, and worth asking. And I wish I had a good answer for you. But that's that's what I have. I, um, thank you. Um, I just want to, to, you know, kind of say um, I, I I hope it wasn't insensitive. It was just something that um, you're that it made me think of. So, thank and thank you for your answer. Thank you. No, not at all insensitive. It's it's completely completely relevant. Completely relevant. So I'm glad you asked it. Thank you. And you asked it very sensitively. <laughs> Thanks. Yes. That's so long, but for that reason. Thanks. Anyway, Excellent. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, we've got an, another question that's just come through. Dear all, congrats on your presentations. Coming from the visual field, I am especially interested in the existence of works that bring together the textual and the visual, perhaps drawings made by mothers or works by artists who collaborate with parents in depicting such sensitive moments. Um, so I don't know whether anyone wants to uh, respond to that. Um, and, and anyone that kind of uh, wants to respond with, with text that they have looked at that um, also bring together the textual and the visual? I have a response, but I feel like I've just been talking and talking, so I will, I will, start, please, yeah, so I'll go, take the floor. Go, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, first of all, there's heaps and heaps of work on photography uh, of neonatal loss. Um, a lot of research has found that um, parents um, benefit from keeping photos and anything they can get of, of a child with whom they have very little time. Very often um, at the point of birth, if, if particularly if a, a family isn't expecting to lose their child, they may decline to see the, the baby because they may, for, for a number of reasons, um, the advice is that the, um, the midwives uh, ask and ask again whether they want to see the baby there's a period of time in which they might choose to see the baby and um, offer to take photographs and put them in a sealed envelope so that the families have something, even if they don't look at them then. They, they, it's something that many families have said that they regret very much. So photography is a big field in this. In this. There's a lot of writing and, and research about that. Um, my, my, my specialism, and, and interesting, Jordan talked about the rupture, uh, the, 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 how many bereaved parents become authors. I, I, I'd love to hear more about that. Before, before my rupture and my new departure, um, I was a, a, an artist and researcher of drawing. And, um, and, and every other chapter in, my, in the book that I'm writing deals with um, an analogy between trying to capture something and keep hold of it and keep it alive being being my son and then trying to capture something and hold it and be and keep it alive by not stopping drawing it because during the process of the drawing you're kind of keeping open all of the possibilities for that kind of living thing um you'd think given my experience that i would have more references for you regarding visual art and bereavement i i don't seem to unfortunately thank you <laughs> So there's another comment there. I knew of photography work, but only by professionals. Thank you for detailing the roles of midwives. Your work sounds so fascinating. I look forward to reading it. Thank you. Um, I don't know whether Chris or 
Jordan want to respond to that same question about the crossover between textual and visual? I don't know that I have any insight into that. I do uh, look a lot at visual arts, but not in this context. So no, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't. I'll look that up. Um, the, the only one I know of is um, a text that was published in, so it's a, it was published first as a text, um, a narrative in 2018. Um, and then to go in conjunction with that, sorry, I should say the text is called um, Gaspar entre terre et ciel, um, Gaspar between um, earth and heaven, um, or earth and the sky, if you like as well. Um, and there's a film made of that, which is entitled Gaspar, Soldat d'amour. So Gaspar, the soldier of love, um, and it's uh, it's the both are out now. So the text was published in twenty eighteen, if I remember rightly, the, the film came shortly after that. Um, it's a story of a, a family, a Catholic family. So the film is heavily funded by the Catholic Church, um, and it very has a lot of religious connotations um, in there. But it's um, a visual representation of their story. So they kind of have a, a tripartite model of, of sharing their story. So um, it started off, the first instance was a Facebook page um, by the same title as the, as the narrative, and then it became the text and then became the film. So it kind of has this three step process. Um, but I, I work predominantly as well on, on narratives and written text. So I wouldn't have much more than that, but that, that is one that um, I have looked at in the context of, of the narratives. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, remember uh, everyone, you can either write your questions in the, the group chat or you can put your hand up uh, and then I can uh, uh, let you ask, ask your question on, on camera. Um, in, in the meantime, if there are no uh, further questions, I just had a, an, a question for Christina. Um, in, your, in your paper, you were talking about the space of the hospital being uh, I think you said you, you quoted it's uh, only pain and only sickness are allowed in this space. And then and then you had that um, the, the quote about uh, the, the person who was. Um, who, who was yeah lying next to her father and she was kind of like experiencing pleasure, etc. And I was just wondering, I mean, you, you saw like my uh, what I presented in, in the first week about I was trying to think about like how the actual spaces of the hospital could be different and could actually do uh, different things for both patients and for the families of patients. And it's a really difficult question, but I just wanted to ask, how do you think that, I don't know, the physical spaces of the hospital could be kind of more open to, to allowing things other than, than pain and sickness? And, and how, could they, how could hospitals be more welcoming to um, other experiences of illness, I guess? You're really asking me a tricky and complicated question to solve a big problem. <laughs> Thank you for this question. Actually, what is interested and what, what I was interested in in this novel is the fact that this child, since she was two till she was 16, sort of grew and was impregnated with all of the elements of both pain and pleasure, the good and the bad in a very equal manner. And before her father and uh, the entire life of her father was at home. So there was no real space of the hospital as such. There was the, the, the medical space was non-existent until she herself got into it because of her own sickness. So then going through this, the, the doctors and hospitals, she had the, um, um, the, the connection to this very uh, aseptisé, the, the space which has nothing in it. And I think her teenager years bringing out all the sexuality and all the hormones and, and the, this element of trying to get over this morning it was explored and exploded in a way in this hospital space. It was a way to get over it. I'm not sure how it, it it should be done how it could be done. I come from Eastern Europe where the uh, whole medical uh, context, the institution is even less developed and more rigid as it is in Europe on the Western world. So it is a very complicated question as I guess it's a lot of means, intellectual 
theoretical, but also practical, economical means and lawmaking and things like that. Uh, but it is a very complicated question. It, it is a place where people should be and ha should have contact, the living and the living, the, the less living, let's say. And it is a place that could bring people together and help mourning processes. I don't know if it always does that. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, we, we've only got time for a, a couple more questions. So uh, we've got uh, a comment from Claire who says, Hi, Tamarin. Firstly, I'm very sorry for your loss, but glad that you got to meet Gabriel. I gave birth eight years ago in, uh, in similar but obviously different circumstances and have written significant amounts of experimental nonfiction and poetry exploring the spaces that you discussed. I've just finished a 20 minutes time-based media art installation as part of a postgrad um, master's at Glasgow University and exploring liminality and materiality in the spaces of the stages of labour leading to unexpected, sorry, to expected neonatal death. I think the cultural script is changing and I would love to discuss our respective research as we have much in common, although differing approaches uh, focuses. I was also struck by your thoughts on darkness as I coordinate a project on women and aloneness and darkness. I'm just finishing my book, which is pro-choice, but an attempt to explore the nuance of feeling. A thousand times yes. Um, I'd love to email, exchange email addresses with you and we must have, a, have long Zooms, please, Claire. Thank you. How can um, how can we, uh, Ben, would you be able to put us in touch? Do you have both our email addresses? I don't know if you can hear me. I haven't got a hand to put up. I, I can't, I'm hopeless on Zoom, so I didn't even know if my comment came up or not. But yeah, um, I followed you on Twitter, so you can find me there or you can email me at cleararchibaldwriter at gmail.com. Thank you, Claire. Yeah, oh, that's fantastic. to speak about what you're doing. Um, and I know other women who are also doing stuff in the same area, so there's actually quite a lot of people out there. Um, Wonderful. I'm yeah. quite new to this. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'd like to but yeah. But yeah, it's really great what you're doing, so thank, thank you. you. Well, I'm fascinated. I'm really, really excited to find out more about what you're doing. Thank you. OK, I'll find you on Twitter. Thank you, Claire. Yeah, ju just to anyone that wants to ask any of the speakers today questions or kind of like find anyone that's participated participated in the series, um, uh, either you can do that on Twitter or if you send an email to the uh, to the, the email address for the series, which is womenmedhums.com. Uh, 2020 at gmail.com then either me or Becky can put you in touch with um, with uh, someone that you want to continue the discussion with uh, yeah so Becky has had to leave I think but she had a question so she said a question for Tamarin and Jordan you both mentioned literature and reading for grieving pa uh, parents particularly Jordan with the quotation referencing Hugo um, is there a therapeutic function to this reading or more didactic or informative. Essentially, what is the purpose of reading for parents? Um, it's a very good question. <laughs> um, and one that I'm trying to work through at the minute. Um, so far, I haven't really considered so much about parents reading their texts and more thinking about um, what they write, how they write, what they gain through the writing experience. Um, and actually in that case, in almost all of the texts that I am working on, the parents explicitly say that it's not therapeutic, it's not cathartic, that's not their aim in writing. Um, and actually it's, uh, so in Dull's text, um, she says in, in that interview that I referenced quite a lot throughout, throughout my presentation um, with Bernard Lou on um, France Inter, I think, uh, she, yeah, she says that it's a, a geste poétique, so a, yeah, a poetic act or a, an artistic act, creative act. Um, and that she follows that model from Philippe Forest, um, if anyone knows him, of um, an être de papier, so a being made of paper. And then Dolly goes on to quote that in, in, in the opening of her second text, which really addresses the, um, the loss of her mother. And there's a whole spiral then that results from this first loss that she goes back to revisit subsequent, or sorry, prior losses um, in subsequent texts. So I'd say in terms of the parents' writing, that no, um, it's not uh, cathartic or therapeutic. Um, in terms of why Doll 
reads uh, those other texts and kind of explicitly quotes or references them in her work, I'm not quite sure. Um, I imagine that there's an attempt there to try and engage and, and to reach out and connect with other people who have lived through the same experience because there's such a, an overt rejection and a misunderstanding, at least, and, and in some cases, because I have done um, a short period of placement with the Pediatric Palliative Care Unit in, in Brest, in, in France, and there the parents that I met and spoke with they said that they felt completely isolated and alone. People didn't want to talk to them. You know, at the, at the school gates, people people who knew um, that they'd lost a child didn't want to engage. They would kind of look away. The, the director of the team actually wouldn't tell people that this was her line of work um, because people instantly would, you know, would, wouldn't want to engage and just didn't know what to say to her and all the rest of it. So I think, it, particularly in the French context, there still is that taboo. Um, so I wonder if perhaps it's an attempt to, to engage, to reach out and to be almost in the company of people who understand what it is to lose a child. Yeah, I think that's a, a good part of the reason that I, I found some of the literature that I found as well. Um, I mean, when I was pregnant, I just kind of bought every book I could find that had anything relevant in the descriptions. And it, it ended up being a literature review. I mean, we don't stop being academics, do we? When we um, and I found that obviously there are a lot of um, advice books for midwives, you know, best practice, this is what we do, this is what we say, this is sensitivities. Um, there are also um, practical books that tell you about ways you can f create memories during the pregnancy and what you do at the birth and what will happen afterwards and, and sort of very inf informative in that way. Um, very often I found that the books of, about any, anybody who was writing about keeping their child once they knew that the child would, was, would likely not survive to birth or, or afterwards, very often the imperative to, to actually make that decision comes from a religious framework. Now I'm an atheist, that doesn't, that's not, that wasn't what was involved in my decision making. So when I read those books, there was a lack of company I found. You know, there were a lot of frameworks and metaphors and images and, and ideas and, and consolations that didn't feel relevant um, because I, I did turn to the books for company. And you get these podcasts as well. Um, and sometimes um, you just want to you just want to hear the voices of other people who have gone through that. I've not gone to support groups. Um, it just didn't seem to seem I didn't I didn't. But but, you know, so you, you read these things for company. Yeah. And also for information. We have um, uh, we're going to have to uh, wrap up very, very soon, but there's an, one last uh, comment from Julie that says there is some crossover between Jordan's text and Tamarin's writing and the water imagery in relation to the mother child bond might be interesting to explore this doll uh, does a lot of writing in the bath. Yeah, that's that's very true. And, and I know Julie's worked a lot on this, actually, and she has an excellent article that explores it in, in great detail. But the idea of um, the bath as as a space um, reminiscent of the womb and um, the water as the ambiotic fluid and the connection, the very much embodied experience of female of maternal grief. Um, so, yeah, Julie's the expert on that. So I don't want to <laughs> don't want to go into that too much. But there are definitely some some very interesting parallels between what Doll's doing here and, and Tamara, what you spoke about in your, your presentation. Julie, I would absolutely love to be in touch with you if that's possible. I wonder if we can find each other on Twitter or somewhere else. I'd love to learn more about that. I'm very much feeling my way. It was something sure. that- Sure. Yeah, I, can, I'm sure, no, I have got, haven't got my camera on, but I've got my mic on. But yeah, I'll find you on Twitter. I'm on Twitter as well. Thank you, I would love that. My, my experience of, my knowledge of water comes from my um, so, unexpectedly relevant PhD in fine art about water involving water symbolism and things so there was not not in, never did I expect there to be a connection like this so that's where all my in, insights right. come from so it's just a, a remarkable kind of clash of of life and art so please do let me know more <laughs> sure I will thank you for your paper it was wonderful thank you everyone indeed Right. Thank, thanks so much to everyone as well uh, for your, your papers this evening. We're going to have to stop there. But, um, you know, exactly what me and Becky wanted to do with this uh, with this seminar series is to bring uh, researchers together to have these and uh, to extend these conversations elsewhere. So please get in touch with anyone uh, on Twitter that you want to continue this conversation with or email uh, the, the address that I gave a little bit earlier and that I'll hopefully type in in the group chat. And um, yeah, definitely let's continue these uh, dialogues going. That was absolutely fantastic. Thanks so much to all, all of you. So just to introduce the, uh, the next seminar, seminar four, which Becky put the link for above. Uh, so this seminar uh, will be 
on sexuality, sexual pain, and sexual pleasure. And we'll have three speakers for that as well. So uh, Hannah Loret that will be uh, presenting on laughter in the face of devastation, a qualitative French English study of women's sexual pain in dialogue with Marie-Dominique Arrighi and Hélène Sixou, and Jane Hartshorn, uh, who will be talking about women's contemporary illness, poetry, and the confessional, how the lyric I can reinstate patient subjectivity, and Dr. Jennifer Dingra, um, uh, who is a GP trainee with an interest in sexual health, women's health, and sex education, co-organizer of the BASH public panel and previous externals and press director of Sex Expression UK. Um, so yeah, thanks so much to everyone for coming. Thank you very much again to our uh, speakers today and hopefully see you all next time.